Welcome to The Point. We've got some excellent points for you guys today. Rob Delaney is a comedian. He's got a point about feminism and misogyny, uh, so drama. We'll talk about that. And uh, Miss uh, California contestant Molly Thomas, the first uh, openly uh, lesbian woman to compete in that contest. Well, among the first, because there was someone else in that contest as well. Uh, she has a point that she sent in about her uh, competing there. And then our third point is about uh, Chris Brown and whether he should be allowed to perform at the Grammys. Uh, has he done his penance in, in a matter of speaking? Now, we've got a great panel for you as well. Kelly Carlin is the host of the Kelly Carlin Show, which is unsurprising, I suppose, <laughs> uh, on Sirius Satellite Radio, which, by the way, is where the Young Turks got their start. Oh, fantastic. Right. Also a filmmaker, and uh, speaking of filmmaker, producer and director, Andrea Meyerson, who is from Standout Productions. Mm -hmm. Great to have you here. Thank you. And uh, James Golden, who's a journalist, poet, and the author of Afro Clouds and Nappy Rain, which is up for an NAACP Image Award. So excited. All right. Just before we start, can I ask you what an Afro cloud is? <laughs> <laughs> the imagery of an Afro cloud is just celebration of being a black man and just everything that I wanted to put into um, this work of art. I, I feel like I want to float on an Afro cloud. That's, that sounds fun. It's a good it place to be. Bad. OK, all right. So now, our first point set in by Rob Delaney. And it's a fascinating one. Let's watch. Hi, I'm Rob Delaney, and I'm a comedian. And my point is, Sexism and misogyny are the worst thing in the world. I uh, went with my wife recently to the Museum of Tolerance in Los Angeles. They had a room that just talked about how awful and systemic sexism and misogyny and just awful anti-women stuff is happening every second around the whole globe in every culture, country, color, creed it just doesn't matter and i was like i kind of had an aha moment i just realized i was like oh man women are a little more than half of our population on the whole planet and so many structures exist to just keep them down and hurt them and do the worst things to them and i realized like okay so with racism like you can have people who like aren't racist but are still misogynist i suppose you could have the opposite but it seems to me and this is my non-professional opinion that uh, sexism and misogyny are, are endemic to every culture. And so if we can root them out, if we can root that out of like every culture, everything gradually, you know, across the world, it'd be great if it could happen instantly, that literally every other issue we have would improve. And plus like men and women are two wings of the same bird. So if we are treating women awfully, then the planet can't function. And so, cultures and people and systems that treat women as second class or like fifth class citizens, it must stop. And I think that we can either stop it together and have our world flourish or let it continue and the world will be a toilet and the things that are bad will get worse. Perhaps, perhaps the greatest, most wide reaching political thing that you can do for your planet is to be kind and sensitive and loving uh, to the women in your own life. All right, Kelly, I'm going to start with you. I, I like that he had an aha moment where he's like, God, you know what? Men suck. <laughs> We've been really crappy to women for a long time. And of course, not all of us. But is he right in the central idea that, hey, you know what? If we can just get beyond that, we'd solve so many other problems? Well, you know, I was thinking about this. I think like the big problems on the planet, the really big ones, are like war, poverty, and the environmental destruction. And I think all of those have to do with a relationship with power, like how we relate to our own power, power over things. So, uh, you know, and I think part of the problem is is that men and women, we all have our own relationship with power. And I think a lot of this has to do with the domineering of one class of citizen over another. So. I'd be willing to give it a try, sure. <laughs> yeah, let's try. So, but look, Andrea, here's the thing. As you look at uh, how things are developing now, women are actually kicking men's ass in education. I mean, they're taking them to, to school. Okay, li literally. I didn't even intend that. Uh, I'll be here all night. Uh, don't forget to tip the waiters and waitresses. Anyway, uh, but, you know, and of course, but that doesn't mean they solve the problem. And then as before they have babies, actually, they're actually on par or doing better than men in their careers as well. Talking whole here. But they run into a wall at some point. Uh, even though they're 50.6% of management and professional related occupations, they're only 2.4% of Fortune 500 CEOs. Right. And, and that's interesting. <laughs> Do you think it's, it's mainly because of the baby uh, 
track? No, they I don't think it's mainly because of that. I think that certainly doesn't work in their favor. Um, you know, it takes two to have a baby, but it all falls on the woman. And so, so there are that just automatically puts them like, oh, they're not going to be the best candidate for the job. And, and that, but that isn't. Some women don't have kids and they still don't make it to that level. It's still that oppression. <laughs> you know? Isn't that, I mean, is it, have we still, is it as simple as that? That, you know, the main reason why they have still have a glass ceiling is just simply oppression? I, I think it is. I think there's still that inequity. And even when they make it, by the way, they don't make as much money as their male counterparts. They mm -hmm. still don't. So, uh, James, what do you think here? I mean, is it is it incumbent upon men more than anything else to change this? Because uh, we're in a position where we have more quote unquote credibility. Unfortunately, other men are like, oh yeah, of course, women, yeah, they want more this and they want more that. So, do we have to take the lead here in some sense, or do do we have a responsibility to take the lead? Let me put it that way. Well, absolutely. I mean, there's so many different facets to this level within the feminism um, experience. And I think that one of the biggest things is that we as men have to take charge of um, certain aspects of it because we have caused so much issues um, for women within our country. And it's specifically looking at the history of patriarchy, there has to be a voice from men that resonates in order for us to reach out to other men. Because of course, us guys, we're gonna listen to guys before we listen to girls. So I and mean- it's part of the problem. So, and that's right. why we gotta work to get behind it. But look, let me throw out uh, some, be, be a little bit of a devil's advocate here. Look, when a lot of guys, I know that watch the Young Turks, so when we cover issues like the celebrity divorces, and you see Tiger Woods' wife getting 50%, they're like, why is she getting 50%? Why, why, what's with the equality there? Uh, Tiger Woods is the guy who was golfing. Now, yeah, he cheated on her like crazy, but what's, like, they feel that, they, that this equality run amok. Well, Go. Well, but she, she's got the kids, and she's going to take the kids, and she's going to raise these kids, so she needs the money to do that, first of all. And if, she, and if, I don't know what her career track is or what she wants to do, but I think that's part of it. And yes, and I think probably the divorce laws are based on more traditional idea of marriage, you know, from the earlier part of the century. So, I mean, but I'm guessing if a really, really rich woman gets a divorce from right. a husband, the husband gets 50%. It, it so does, It yeah. does work that way. Yeah. It does work. Tom Arnold. Yeah. <laughs> Case in point, exactly. Um, also, when she's at home, have, they get married under the context that he is a professional athlete, and she's home raising the kids. Whatever she wanted to be, that was kind of killed. Right. You know, I mean, unless they decided to raise really? their kids by uh, nannies. That I'm not buying. Because or she made a choice to not do it anymore. Yeah, because, but I that mean, was but a mutual agreement. Kids. If that's how, that, who knows? I, don't, I wasn't in the room. I don't know what right. they decided when they got but married see, and had kids. But. but see, marriage used to be an economic business agreement. I mean, that's what marriage was. That's and so true, I think yeah. this kind of represents still the echo of that in our culture. Right. You know. And, and James, uh, guys, are, uh, if we are championing women's rights, et cetera, is part of the problem that other guys are like, oh, yeah, right, oh, whipped, you know, yeah, oh, yeah, I bet you were for women. Is that a problem, like this sense of wimpiness, et cetera, if you do that? Well, or? it's part of um, male patriarchy and needing to define what gender roles are. So for a lot of men, we consider um, being masculine and being um, having that certain machismo as a part of being a man. And so you cannot support women's rights unless you're effeminate or you're not a manly man. And so it does take men to um, actually go against what has been traditionally thought of. Which is so important because if we all sat back and said, you know what, AIDS and HIV doesn't affect me. So why should I do anything to help the cause or, right. or poverty or, you know, whatever. It doesn't affect homeless issues. If it, that doesn't affect us, but it uh, really does affect us. So if we don't take a stand for all of these things and work together, unite, you know, work together as one people, really. I know that sounds a little, but I welcome men to take a stance for us, you know? Yeah, and the only issue I had with Rob saying he was like, you know, it's a little bit um, kind of a dream in some way, like, oh, we'll just spread this, you know, this, the news <laughs> that men have to be, and you know, we're really talking about progressive men who are willing to be a part of the solution, who have a different point of view, who are more postmodern in their thinking. Uh, traditional men and traditional cultures, it's a very different relationship with women. And, and you know, how do you, 
bring our progressive, postmodern point of view to these other cultures. I mean, we see it happening all the time with us butting our business into other people's cultures yeah, and how you know, well look, that goes. Kelly, let me ask you a follow-up on that because, look, your, your father's George Carlin, right. and so he used to speak about this power dynamic within his comedy all the time. Yes. And, and I got a sense from him that it was almost like a little defeatist, like, what are we going to do? A bunch of guys run the world. We're all screwed, right? right? Yes. And like you think you vote and you think you have an effect, et cetera. And no, they get together in a room, they decide and you're all hosed. Is that true for women too? And, and, you know, what's his, what do you think his sense of it was? What's your sense of it? No, I mean, I, I think my dad had a very particular point of view. And plus he, he heightened it for theatrical reasons, right, you know, and right. to make a point. But he was a broken hearted, hearted idealist. Absolutely. He, he believed in all of these ideas. But he also believed that there were these kind of owners. And when you talked about the disparity between managers versus the boardroom of women, you know, those are the owners of America. Right, and, right, that's, exactly. and that's a club of basically white males for the most part. And they're not wanting, inviting people in. You know, look at the 99% movement. You know, I mean, it's, it's all about that. So but I have a different point of view. I believe that we can make a change. I mean, look at the last hundred years. Change has happened even inside this screwed up system. Yeah, I'm, I'm more of an optimist. I'm with you on that, actually. And, but, it, you know, it's not that he doesn't have a great point. No. He does. And, and, you know, like when affirmative action, for example, a lot of times people don't get it. It's like, well, the guy, the plumber or the, or the fireman or whatever, he wants to give the job to his son. So and he's like, why are these black people coming and taking my son's job? And it's the same in the boardrooms. They're like, you know, we're, we're used to having this. Right. Why are these women coming in here and butting <laughs> into our business? Yes. But let me throw one last wild card in there. Uh, you know, sometimes I get in trouble with the audience, even though I'm supposed to be super lib, right? Because I talk about how hot women are, right? right. And I'm like, oh, she's hot. She's hot. And is it okay to, in certain circumstances, say, hey, you know what? I'm sexualizing that woman because I think she's hot. Okay, but it doesn't mean I sexualize all women. It's not like I'm sitting there going, oh, Hillary Clinton, oh, Madeline Albright. You know, well, is that you, permissible you, or no? Are you sexualizing her? Or are you just? Or are you just noticing that she's hot? I mean, some if you're attracted to, it, I think it's okay to think. I think you know people are hot. You know, I mean, <laughs> I don't think that sexualizing them, you could admire one's beauty. You uh -huh. know, and and but it's different. I mean, like if you're in a, you know, if you're in a corporate meeting and you're like, wow, she's got really nice. You know, that's not okay. Well, that's that's sexualizing. That's why you hired her because yeah, she's got nice yeah. rockers or well, something. Well, that yeah. would be a problem. There's, yes. There's a, there's a, there's a, a line there. It's like it's okay to admire one's beauty and be attracted to somebody and notice that. It's fine. It's not okay to make a sex object, sex object out of them. It's very different. Which is what tends to happen in our society in general is we like to objectify women and um, look at them for what they have rather than what they have underneath their heads. And so for a lot of especially music artists, um, they're objectified rather than um, seen as talented individuals beyond their sexuality or beyond, you know, their beautiful figure. Right. Which Ma perpetuates the problem, exactly. by the way, which right. continues to perpetuate the inequities. Yeah, I, I guess my last point on that would be that, look, it, it's, it depends on the context, right? So if you're at a bar and you say to your buddy, hey, look, she's really hot, that doesn't necessarily do, say anything about that woman other than the fact that that's the context that you're in. But if you're in a boardroom or you're in politics and you're like, oh, well, what do you think about her policy proposal? And you're like, oh, I don't know, she's hot. Okay, then you got issues. Anywhere in the workplace. In the, you know, it's very different if you're at a bar and people are looking to meet other people. And if you're in any kind of a workplace, it's just really not cool. Like right. any kind of a professional setting, it's just. Right. We're all agreed on that. But speaking of hot, when we come back, the first openly lesbian uh, Miss California pageant contestant. And boy, is she hot. <laughs> Back on the point, uh, we now have a point sent in by Miss California USA beauty pageant contestant Molly Thomas. Uh, she is openly lesbian and she decided to compete in that manner. Was that the right thing to do? Let's watch. Hey, thanks for having me on the point. I'm Molly Thomas. I was recently the first openly gay woman to run for Miss California USA. Um, by running, I, I made some waves and really challenged the stereotypes of not only beauty pageants, but also of sexual orientation. Um, when I initially decided to run, um, the question was never whether or not I was going to run openly. 
that was that was never an option. Um, the question was whether or not I was going to run at all. I. I'm proud of who I am, I'm comfortable in my own skin, and I don't believe that it's ever necessary to put on a facade. So I decided to run openly, and um, I'm so happy with that decision. <laughs> I, uh, I went in there really to push the boundaries and to say, look, you can be a strong and attractive and feminine woman and be a lesbian, and there's nothing wrong with that. Ultimately, I'm, I'm trying to promote visibility and acceptance of diversity and let people know that it's okay to be comfortable in your own skin and to be proud of who you are and really just embrace who you are down to your core. And It doesn't matter what color or size or shape or gender or sexual orientation you were born um, because beauty comes from what you do with it not what you look like or who you love. And I think that's a really, really important message to get across, and at the end of the day, that's why I ran. Um, you can follow my campaign at mollythomasformissca.com. <laughs> Thanks. All right, Andrea, I'm going to start with you. Uh, uh, you are openly lesbian as well. And oh, no, I wasn't. Oh, is that right? <laughs> <laughs> Damn it! <laughs> Wish somebody had told me that. Well, I am uh, now. Well, well, you are now. Uh, so, uh, is this a good thing for the lesbian community, the LGBT community, to have a woman run in a beauty pageant? Is that a positive step? Uh, you know what? It's not a good thing. It's not a bad thing. I mean, I really think if somebody wants to run in a beauty contest, um, I, you know, heterosexuals don't make a big thing. Like, by the way, I'm heterosexual and I'm running in a beauty contest. Right. I'm like, just be who you are, and if that's if that's what you want to do, go do it. I mean, I think it's. It doesn't matter. It just doesn't matter. She's a beautiful, bright young girl. She aspires to be a beauty queen, okay? That's her dream. Everybody gets their dream, and we live in a country where we could pursue that and hopefully conquer it. So let her have it. I, mean, I just think the fact that she's lesbian, I love that she's open. I love that she's out. Like, that's huge, because mm -hmm. I'm sure there have been many that have run <laughs> that have been closeted. So it's a big step to be able to be out in anything you do. We shall be honest about that. D does it help? Does it uh, not matter that she happens to be very attractive? Uh, does that break down stereotypes? Uh, I don't know. You, uh it, I mean, listen, I, we live in a society that looks mean a lot, and the stereotype of lesbians have been, like, you know, a little more butch. Right. And um, so I think that, and we come in, you know, Lesbians come in all shapes and sizes and God looks, and hearts. there's a lot of us fans, <laughs> and there's a lot. So it doesn't, you know, I, the package, it's a package. But it is great for those people in Iowa, or I, I shouldn't, those people in Iowa places. Iowa has gay marriage. Yes, they it's do. It's legalized gay marriage, so right. you couldn't have picked a worse example, <laughs> but yes. But for those people that um, maybe don't people. under, more to, that are, are not exposed to the LGBT community, that have an image that all lesbians look, you know, butch or whatever, right. whatever they think in their head, whatever they conjure up, because, you know, frankly, the media doesn't always represent us in the, you know, they'll pick the butchest woman in the crowd and the most right. flamboyant man when they want to cover anything that has to do with Right, and I think it all helps to break down barriers because the more people know someone who's gay, they're like, oh, Absolutely. she's gay? Oh, well, hey, I'm, Huge. you know. Huge. Right. I, I think so, too. But how about beauty pageants? Let's talk yeah. about that. Is that acceptable, unacceptable these days? Well, I, I mean, they're kind of ridiculous. Mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's awkward to watch them. I, I mean, I think, you know, when I started becoming more politically active and, and smart thinking and watch them and think, oh, now they're going to put bathing suits on? This is so, don't you know how obviously awkward and weird this is? So. It, all in all, it's it's a strange kind of thing. It's like a circus or something, you know. You see, I don't know when it happened to me, but I feel the same way now. But you have you have to understand the concept. I'm actually Mr. Jamaica. Now, not a lot of people know that, but <laughs> what, what happened was uh, I was dating a, a woman, and she decided that she was going to go run for Miss Jamaica because she's from Jamaica, and she won. <laughs> okay, and so she was Miss Jamaica, and hence right. I call myself Mr. Jamaica. Right. And I remember at the time I was so proud, and I thought it was fantastic. I went down to Miss Universe contest and, and rather enjoyed it. But at some point, I was like, yeah. you know, I don't know when it happened, what year, but I was like, they come out in bathing suits. It's, 
That's re yeah. isn't that ridiculous? With, with high heels oh, it's, on. It's, it's just, with high heels. Yes. Right. Which so you can't even. Yeah. It's, it's crazy. <laughs> I mean, I you know I have never been one to think that wow beauty pageant like I've never aspired to do that not that I could but I never aspired to be like oh I want to be Miss America. I like I don't get the whole thing but it's a society thing. I mean yes. that's that's where their value is. That's where they think their self worth is. Like I'm beautiful. I have this body. This is my shell. Like this is. And you know what? Our society says, yeah, you are. We're because gonna make you famous. It feeds into the same patriarchy that we're talking Absolutely. about, which is that women are objects. And so if we're in a pageant, then of course we're objectifying you, and that's all we see you as. It's interesting that they have interview questions now, but um, it's just, I don't understand why we continue to allow these types of venues to flourish. Because they make money. Well, well at that's least one they answer. used to. They I don't, used to, I don't right. think they make as much money as they used to. I mean, Trump lost a lot of money doing this. Miss well, University. Trump loses money in almost everything, everything he yeah. does. But so, if they ask you to be, uh, you know, we're going to determine who the best guy in California is, James, and uh, we we need you to dress up in a speedo. <laughs> I don't think I'm ready for a speedo yet. <laughs> but no, I want it to be based on my intellect and based on what I have to offer. And I think that Molly actually has some um, progressive ideas, and that's what makes her placement in this. Um, very appropriate. I mean, she's bringing light to um, issues about gay suicide, and she's bringing light to um, issues that um, concern a certain community in California. And I mean, it's just really refreshing to see that. Yeah, and she's gone to Thailand and Mongolia. I think it was Mongolia, yeah, and and world. you know, all over the world to work on human rights, etc. And there was another lesbian contestant, by the way, in the same pageant, mm -hmm. uh, and she went non-traditional instead of a bikini, wearing a tuxedo, etc. Mm -hmm. So it was interesting choices, but made by both. But of them. she's, you know, she's a yeah. I believe she's only 19, and she's so articulate and. Um, it just, I, I love that we live, I love the progress the LGBT community has made, that a 19-year-old could feel safe and proud and just be out there who she is. That's like, like huge. That would have never happened even like five years ago, 10 years, it's really but progressive. you remember like however many years ago, was it maybe 20 years or so when Vanessa Williams was caught right. in a picture right. kissing a yes. girl right. and they stripped her of yes. the crown? Right. Yes. Absolutely. That, that was a huge thing back then. Now if you catch them in that picture, it, Everybody it wins. Here, right. <laughs> it, it, <laughs> I mean, they, but she, Vanessa Williams also got uh, really famous back then. But can I ask you guys, let me, Andrea mainly actually, is it, how, is it a permissible for heterosexual men uh, to be turned on by lesbian women? <laughs> is or is that like the most annoying thing in the world? Oh, God, what a question. Is it permissible? I mean, like, well, we, we're not going to be able to stop that, really, are we? <laughs> no, um, I suppose not. <laughs> so, but, I mean, but is it like. Do we accept it? Do we yeah. say, I, I mean, I really think it depends on the person. We're all different. I can't say, I can't speak for the entire lesbian community, you know. Um, you know, I don't, I personally don't give a shit, <laughs> you know, like, <laughs> I mean, you know, I have straight friends that, you know, I've been with my girlfriend and, and they openly talk about it. And, you know, I'm like, okay, whatever. It's a good thing you're my friend because you're pretty obnoxious. But, but I mean. That for, would be me. Yeah, but I mean, I, listen, it, we all know that, I mean, look at porn. You know, where the uh, two, well, girl, when you, <laughs> <laughs> so you know when you're watching girl on girl action, and you know, by the way. Is that happening for porn? Well, yeah. like, okay. Okay. It, right. yeah, I've heard, I've heard. <laughs> and, you know, they, first of all, um, they're not real lesbians, because you could tell by their nails. <laughs> They've got really long fingernails. So okay, that's, speaking of stereotypes. Okay. Right. Okay. It's true. Okay. Well, well uh, actually, I do have some lesbian friends that have long nails. I would but. feel complimented if a woman was attracted to me, a lesbian, I'm, I mean, I'm hetero, but right. I, I would I would be okay with that. I mean, so it, I think it goes both ways. Yeah, I, I used to live in Miami Beach, and uh, where I don't know if you guys know this, but on South Beach it turns out there's a lot of gay guys. Hmm. Yeah, I found that out. Wow. Oh uh, really? yeah. And whenever a friend of mine came by, like we worked out at a gym there that was predominantly gay, etc. Whenever a friend of mine would come by, they'd always hit on him, but they never hit on me, and I was like, what? I'm like, what? what? Well, what's wrong with me? What's yeah, going on? Yeah. But, <laughs> but and, you know, traditionally, it, like you said, a lot of men are turned on by lesbian relationships and they want to see that in porn and they're, you know, intrigued by that. But at the same time, they're repulsed by same sex men relationships. And that is where, again, we have issues with um, the way that men think traditionally in our country. And so, I mean, it needs to be balanced and it needs to be appropriate. No, that's absolutely right. And I guess my last point on it is. You know, men are these, like the guys that are old school, let's put it that way, let's be kind and say old school. They're funny because they're like, women definitely should not get married. They should only hook up while I'm watching. 
Right. Yeah. Hello. <laughs> yeah, that makes no sense. All right. Now, when we come back, Chris Brown is invited back to the Grammys. Is that uh, the right thing to do? Should we give him a pardon? Is it time for redemption? Find out when we come back on The Point. Back on the point, and for our third discussion today, uh, we took the issue of Chris Brown being back at the Grammys. Now, of course, three years ago, uh, they were famously going to the Grammys with uh, 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 Rihanna when uh, the incident happened where he assaulted her, uh, and now he's been invited back. So, uh, let's start with you, James. Uh, is it ready? Are we ready to pardon him? Is it okay to have him back, or is it still unacceptable? Well, number one, let's just identify the irony in this: that it is the Grammy Awards, and this is the largest um, and most important music event in the world. But more than that, let's not categorize this as an assault because it was much more than assault. Rihanna almost died, and it was for so many people just another hideous and heinous act of aggression towards women. So it is a lot more than just a typical assault. But at the same time, Chris Brown absolutely does not need to be at the Grammys yet. One of the things that I have an issue with is the fact that every time that Chris Brown has made an appearance, um, whether he's apologized, there has not been um, a remorse that has been backed by any kind of need to um, rectify the situation. It's always just been about saving the career and saving face. So that's one of the issues. And, you know, the larger issue here is that America has a, an affinity for excusing aggressive male um, behaviors, especially and particularly in the entertainment industry. That's really interesting, and I see what you're saying about that. And sometimes if you say the wrong words, you'll get in so much more trouble than if you're actually abusing your girlfriend, et cetera. Mm -hmm. like, like, people always talk about Charlie Sheen and he's winning before breakfast, but didn't he beat up his girlfriend? Uh, or am I thinking of the wrong person? Did we see pictures of her? Because I think that's also the other issue here is that there were pictures broadcasted all over the internet of Rihanna, who for a lot of especially black women, young black women, but also just young women in general, she was their idol. And to have her pulverized via picture and the picture circulated and seen over and over and over again in the media, it just made such um, an incredible, indelible mark on our society that the Grammys um, bringing Chris Brown on seems like a slap in the face three years later. That's really strong. Uh, but, okay, I, so I got to follow up on it, uh, which is, what's enough? And let me open that up to everybody. What, when you say, okay, you know what, that guy, what, really means it? How do we judge that? What's enough? Well, I think you have to think about what's enough in your own personal life with uh, people you know. Uh, what is enough? Is this person a, uh, a serial offender? Is he a psychopath? Uh, you know, is he a sociopath? Does he really not have the ability to, to rehabilitate himself? Uh, is there actual remorse? Is he working on, or she, becoming a better human being? I mean, all but those do things... do we judge that collectively? Do we no, sit in no. judgment of Chris Brown and say, okay, you have now become officially a better human being, we can move forward? We do it with our actions. We uh -huh. do it with our agency as a people, as a society. And so we control the music market. Yet if we're supporting his music, then what are we really saying as a society once again, which is that um, it's, it's okay for women to be beat? So should I not go to Mel Gibson movies? It's uh, a good question. It is a good question. It's, you know, I mean, I think that's got to be, everybody has a personal take, and it's such an interesting, I don't know the right answer. I will tell you, I, I won't go see a Mel Gibson movie, and, you know, Jodie Foster, a, les, a lesbian, produced it, directed it, and I still won't go see anything he's in, you know, so she is out uh, now, isn't she? Uh, yes. Okay. Uh, is she? she? Is out. She's out. Okay, <laughs> all right, well, we're adding a lot of people on the show. Okay, okay. Well, well, shoot, if you're not out, well, no, she is out. She, she came is. out. She is. Anyway, I can't go see a Mel Gibson movie now. Um, Chris, and yet she's friends with him. She with is friends, and he's been homophobic too. He's had homophobic slurs, right? So, and, and yet I think he's probably a person who's very, uh, a very a man who's suffering, and it probably has some alcoholism and some other issues, and has some mental health issues. So, you know, where do you draw the line on that? You know, I, it's such a tough, tough thing, Chris. With Chris Brown, though, he is not, like, he just had a, the whole anger, he's got anger management. I mean, he just Absolutely. threw a chair Absolutely. through the window the last time he just was interviewed a few by months yeah. ago. Yes. So, I mean, like, I don't, you know, and, and if he wasn't a celebrity, he'd be in jail. Hands down, at yep. this point, he'd be in jail yeah. for what he did. 
Yeah, you know, and that's the other thing that's maddening, of course, about Lindsay. Like the Occupy guys in L.A., they sat in jail waiting on $5,000, $10,000 bail, et cetera. Lindsay Lohan was out in like 80 seconds, right? And so it's just, it's so maddening, uh, that power dynamic there, too. But, you know, I just don't know where to draw the line here. And that's very unusual for me, because I love to have strong well, opinions. I, but, I, like, so R. Kelly, it's, I mean, urinating on underage girls. Jesus, when do we ever forgive that? No, I, we, we don't. Right. We don't, because R. Kelly has a history of perpetrating young women, okay? He also married Aaliyah when she was 14 years old. So he has a history of doing that. Chris Brown has a history of male aggression and violent behavior that's unacceptable, which is why it confuses me that the Grammys would honor him with a coveted position to perform rather than, say, Jill Scott. And, and with him, see, he's made no effort to show remorse or apology, like nothing, like nothing. There have been no steps. What has he done to to break to break through that. Uh, you what? guys win. Okay, Chris Brown should not be back. Okay, you convinced me because the, a chair throwing, to no, not nearly enough remorse. And I saw when he read his lawyer's statement, uh, he's like, yeah. and then my lawyer says I should say, I'm like, oh come on, come on, come on. I mean, he didn't say my lawyer says, but it was obvious the way he was reading. But see, it. I'm so fascinated by how, as a culture, we kind of become hypnotized by all of this. And and my theory is that. You know, for us, uh, because we're mostly a secular culture, that celebrity has become our gods, and our, so we worship them. And it activates, I think, this part in our psyche where we don't think rationally and reasonably anymore. So literally, the neurons that we use to, like, understand and maybe have a, you know, moralize and, and draw a line about these things doesn't get activated in this There's way. There's some chance I'm going to give you the point of the week for that comment. Uh, yes. In fact, we've never had a point of the week before, but you might get the first <laughs> award. Uh, because, you know, I read this study where the monkeys look at alpha males within, their, within the monkey world, and they will hand them bananas. Mm -hmm. like, like, even though they should eat the banana, and they wouldn't hand it if it's not an alpha male, but they see an alpha male, and they're like, oh, and they want to watch it on TV. They put it on TVs, and they want to hand the banana to the TV. And that's how we are, you know? We're like, I, no matter what they do wrong, we're like, here's our banana. Yeah. Yeah. The point is that this goes back to patriarchy once again. Because if you look at the entertainment industry, when women are placed in the same position that Chris Brown are in, they are vilified yep. completely. Lindsay Lohan has been vilified. Britney Spears was vilified. Whitney Houston has been vilified. All of these artists who haven't nearly done anything close to what well, Chris well, Brown well, has done. Janet say, Jackson exposes her others. nipple, yeah, yeah. and then she becomes the Antichrist in America. So when you really look but at this. But did you see that nipple? But did you see what happened to Justin Timberlake? Lake with the rest of his career and what happened to hers. I mean, she was one of the biggest artists in the entire history of America. And yet she was vilified because she did the exact same thing that Justin Timberlake participated and in. And it's not even about making a mistake. I mean, just powerful, strong women. I mean, look at Barbara Streisand, who's a perfectionist, who's a, a you know very right. powerful woman and is a difficult person to be with as an artist, but she has a point of view. Look at James Cameron. You know, same thing. He's he's as much of, of an asshole on the set as she is, <laughs> and yet so she's hear. she's right, and she's yet she's the diva. yes. Well, it, it's always that way. It's always if the woman, if it's a strong woman with an opinion that wants it done perfectly, right. she's a bitch. Right. Or she's but if a it's a guy, right. he's brilliant. Exactly. Like it, he's doing what he's supposed to do. He's right. an right. alpha male. He's taking. Sense. He's the general. He's taking the position. Can I get you guys to pardon anyone on this show? So, uh, Chris Brown's out. How about uh, Michael Vick? He served his sentence. He's He's back. He's really good. <laughs> okay, as long as he so, can't go near an animal, I, I okay. don't know. I mean, I, it's, so, it's so... Is it okay that he's with the Eagles and well, playing see, football but again? But see, I think we have to believe in rehabilitation on some level. Right. I yeah, aren't culture. we libs? I mean, I don't know. I'm speaking yeah, for myself. Yeah, I am. But, okay. I am, and I do believe in rehabilitation, and I believe in giving people a second chance. So... But, uh, and he know. has done the time. He has, but, but I, I think there's got to be some, like, to go back and make millions. I mean... Tie a percentage of his income exactly. to like uh, no. to animal abuse but, uh, or something. There's a certain responsibility that you have oh, as an artist yeah. to rectify your situation. Yeah. When Rihanna was beat, she provided several music videos that went against domestic violence, mm -hmm. and you don't see that from Chris Brown. You don't see anything that's countering his behavior and his actions, and it's just another example of Americans in our society promoting excessive abuse of women. 
I'm also going to give you an award, James, for Defender of Women Award. Yes, uh, I There's agree. never been a, a man on the show that defended women as much as you, James, and I appreciate and that. So they get awards, I'm going home empty-handed. Well, you already, but we discussed this before the show. It's because, Andrew, you already have like 28 awards. <laughs> you do. So it was already unfair. We're, I'm just trying to even things out. The only person left awardless at the end of the night is going to be me. Okay. <laughs> All right, one last one, because I can't resist, because I find this so fascinating, because I don't know the answers. Michael Richards, okay, says something terrible, right? But that dude was apologetic. I mean, he looked destroyed when he when he went on to apologize, etc. He's going through this, the, you know, he's going to therapy, yada yada yada. Can we pardon him or no? You know, I feel like he sincerely. It was the worst. It was terrible. So many things happen in comedy clubs that don't get. I mean, that is a. That's a typical slur in a comedy club. I mean, you know, I produce comedy specials. I scam at them. I scout. It's a, it, but because he's a celebrity, it got out. But and, and, and it doesn't make it right. It. Yeah, yeah, it was terrible. Yeah. It was terrible. He does seem sincerely, sincerely apologetic. I mean, he really does feel like he. It seems like he's hurting. But, you James, know, at it least was... he didn't hurt women. Can you, uh, does that help? <laughs> no, because there's no apology that's good enough for racial epithets. And you really have to accept responsibility as an artist. If you're going to make that mistake, okay. you have to accept that these are the ramifications of what happens. James is not letting no. anyone off the hook here. You, know, <laughs> you know, there's been so many celebrities that have had the worst homo homophobic slurs as well. Oh, yeah, that, when you get into that category, you're it's, eliminating it's a lot happening. of folks. It's a keeps yeah. But, yeah. but all of it, none of it's no. okay. None of it is okay. Like, and if you don't punish the person that, did, like, it has to change. It just has to change. Uh, so. But I think part of this uh, conversation helps to educate people, and or not even necessarily to educate, but to have them start thinking about it. Right. And going, hey, you know what? Maybe James is right. Why is there disparate treatment of women and men in similar situations, et cetera? And why do we think it's okay to get beyond what Chris Brown did when it appears that he hasn't learned very much from it? So I really appreciate all of you coming on to have this discussion. Thank you. And uh, now I want to let everybody know what's going on. First of all, James B. Golden, which is, by the way, an awesome name. You get an award for that as well. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> his book is Afro Clouds and Nappy Rain. We're rooting for him to win a second award, the NAACP Image Award. Not quite as illustrious as the award I just gave you, but OK. Plus America. And, uh, and Andrea Meyerson, she's with Standout Productions. And she's got like a million things coming out. On March 14th on Showtime, Lip Service, hosted by Nisi Nash. Yep. And that's interesting. And then you've got a documentary, I Stand Corrected, coming out as well. And then this Sunday, on Sirius Satellite Radio, on Raw Dog, the Kelly Clark, uh, Kelly Carlin. I'm Kelly sorry. Clarkson. I know. How I was that American for a little <laughs> You know why? I just saw a commercial for Sirius with Kelly Clarkson. Anyway, the Kelly Carlin show debuts. Yes. And you've got Robin Williams as a I guest. I do, a great conversation with Robin. All right, that's fantastic. And I want to thank Rob Delaney, who sent in a point, and, uh, of course, Molly Thomas as well. I want to thank all of you guys for joining us, and we will see you next week.